I don't think there's anything in any shape or form in the corporate world that prepares you for being an entrepreneur. No. And then the very first deal I did was a 1.2 million pound JV deal with people I'd met on Mastermind. Yeah. So the, the skill in terms of knowing what kind of property to buy, yes. where to buy it and what to do with it is kind of where the, where the magic lies really. Everyone thinks that retail's dead, but if you've got a high street where there's very limited shops and every single shop is always full, and when one shop comes up, there's a queue of tenants waiting to take it. That is, you know, in 30 yes. years of property, that is absolutely the number one tip. Hello and welcome to the Property Magic Podcast. And this episode, I've got a very special guest. Now normally we have either an industry expert or we have someone who's one of our successful students to inspire you and build your belief about what's possible. Today we've got a combination of the two, so I'd like to welcome Susie Carter. Susie, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Really good, thank you. So as well as a, obviously one of our very successful students, you're actually a real expert in commercial property, Susie, aren't you? I am. So would you like to give everyone a little bit of background introduction to so how you become such a commercial property expert? Sure, so I'm a charter surveyor. I've been a charter surveyor for 30 years now, which is terrifying. And um, I've got a corporate background, so I've worked for uh, corporates for a big chunk of my career. Um, CBRE, b q Land Securities, and then I gave all that up in 2015 when I came on Mastermind. Yep. And now um, I'm a residential and commercial investor and I help others invest in commercial property. Great, so we'll look at the we'll look at comparison between commercial and residential, because they are different, and there are, there are some pros and cons of both of those, so we'll dig into that in this podcast. But I'd like to understand, you know, someone very experienced in property in the commercial sector, what made you want to come and do Mastermind and get into Resi? It's a really good question. So I don't think there's anything in any shape or form in the corporate world that prepares you for being an entrepreneur. No, and, I would agree, yes. And so I, for probably 10 years before I actually gave it the corporate world, I actually knew that I wanted to be an investor. But I literally had no idea where to start, which just sounds in, in crazy when you kind of think about it. When you're doing billion, but, well, not billion, but million pound deals, right? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I managed a portfolio of 2.7 billion. So I wasn't, yeah. it wasn't like I was a newbie to property. No. So, yeah, it was really interesting. And I think the thing that I really wanted to get, I came on the three-day accelerator. Yes. Um, and my husband said to me, you have to go on that. Like, you won't do anything unless you go on that mastermind program. And he was yeah. right. I, I did have to go on it. And I think the mindset it gave me made me yeah. realise that I could be an investor and do my own thing. So I think a lot of things we teach in our advanced three-day accelerator, you probably recognise because you talk about options, we talk about title splits, all of which you've done in commercial world as well. Yeah. But was it kind of, did that help to understand how you actually apply it in, in residential? Yeah, it was like literally like a veil had kind of uncovered from my eyes because a lot of surveyors, my friends who invested, they would buy like a single let in Fulham yeah. Or they, you know, pay full price for it, no creative deals. And, and, and of course, just the fact that you can be as creative as you want, you don't need to put loads of money down, um, the, um, the amount you can add value was just like a bit of a revelation, really. Yeah, and bringing your husband on to three days was pretty important as well to kind of get his buy-in, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. So you came on a year-long mastermind program and, and explained to everyone what you did as a result of being on the program. <laughs> well, it was, it was interesting uh, because I was actually, uh, I'd actually got a three-month-old baby, I don't know whether you remember. I do, I do remember, yeah. And so I really, str really <clears throat> struggled in terms of balancing like this newborn baby and, uh, and, and mastermind. So actually I didn't do a great deal in if I was a bit of a failure the first year in mastermind I didn't really <laughs> do anything um, but I, I soaked it all up and I made yeah. some great contacts <clears throat> yeah. and then it was when and I actually got pregnant halfway through as well with my second child so it was yeah. quite a challenging year but it was absolutely essential because the network I made yes. the the uh, information I got enabled me then to go off and invest later so yeah. I probably had a time lag of a 18 months yeah and then the very first deal I did was a 1.2 million pound JV deal with people I'd met on mastermind yeah which I guess you wouldn't have done if you hadn't have a met the people or knew how to do that kind of deal absolutely yeah right fantastic yeah. I know you've gone on to do lots of other things subsequently so let's talk a little bit about commercial property because I think sometimes people who are new to investing think oh should I do residential or do commercial because there's some real benefits of commercial <coughs> property but I find I think the average person is probably easier than to go into residential first then once they've got some people to move into commercial unless of course maybe someone's a business owner where maybe they've got their own commercial premises and they start commercial then come into resi so, mm. so what's your experience and let's talk about the differences between the two 
Yeah, so I think the, um, I, I totally agree with you. I think a lot of people, and in fact, I started in residential first, which again, like might seem a little bit back, back to front because I, I know commercial. Yeah. But yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think as a bit of a myth buster, you can spend the same amount on commercial as, as resi. Yeah. You don't have to kind of spend multi-millions on commercial, though obviously that, that, that is possible too. But I think the main difference between commercial and, and resi is that you, is the way they're valued. Because mm. commercial property is valued on commercial valuations. So those of you who have big HMOs will know what that is. So you, you apply a multiplier onto the rent. Yep. And um, that is the real beauty of commercial, really, is that you don't have to go in and do expensive refurb works um, to add value. You can actually add value by buying a vacant property, putting a tenant in there and getting rent coming in. So obviously that increases the value. Um, you can um, do paper-based exercises, extend leases, take leases back, all those kind of things. So you sometimes you do need to do refurb works, but you don't have to. Yeah. And, and that is kind of one of the real, you know, you can be much more hands-off. And then when you, when you get the commercial property rented, very often they're longer leases uh, to business tenants, so you can be quite a lot more hands-off as yeah, well. Yeah, it's definitely seen as a, a, a more passive approach. You get paid every quarter, and the tenant does the full repair and insuring lease. So really, you don't have to look after it, which is great. Yeah, and yeah, th there's a there's a real skill there because not every lease is full repairing insuring. Yeah. Not every tenant is going to pay the rent every quarter. Yeah. So the the skill in terms of knowing what kind of property to buy, yes. where to buy it, and what to do with it is kind of where the where the magic lies, really. And it's a bit like residential in a way, in that you could find a very cheap residential, but there's no point buying it if you're not going to find the tenant who wants to live there. So commercial is the same. Exactly. You've got to know how to find the right kind of tenant who would like to take that property on and then have a nice long contract. Yeah, the, big, the biggest tip I can give people is that the commercial market, more than really any market, is about supply and demand. Yeah. So if, you know, if you, everyone thinks that retail's dead, but if you've got a high street where there's very limited shops and every single shop is always full, and when one shop comes up, there's a queue of tenants waiting to take it, you're onto a pretty good thing there because yeah. actually you know you're probably going to get a longer lease better rent better tenant filling the space mm -hmm. so yeah it, it's all about it's all about that really but let's let's talk about the market right now because obviously in a residential it's all a bit shaky you know some areas are plateauing some are going up a little bit some are coming down there's all uncertainty right now about what the labor government might do and also in commercial in commercial there's, there's there's some real opportunities right now in commercial aren't there do you want to explain what some of those are and, and how people listening can take advantage of those sure so i mean there is definitely a window of opportunity in the commercial market to take advantage of lower prices so what happened was that when liz trust did her mini are now infamous mini budget yes. in 2022 the markets got very scared and the commercial market more than any market is really ruled by sentiment yeah. so you know if and, and if, remember there's a lot of sophisticated investors in it as well so um sh sh the, the basically faith in the government faltered yes and as a result the bond yields went up and yeah. the bond yields are like the risk-free rate that you can buy government you can lend to the government at yeah. and commercial property is very tagged against bond bond yields so as bond yields went up to four or five percent nobody's going to buy commercial property at four or five percent because it's risk-free income if you yeah. lend to the government so therefore all commercial yields just moved out they went yes. to you know so prime yields which were at say three four percent moved out to five six percent and there they've stayed really um, obviously, in rising interest rates has meant that, that yields have kind of remained high. And don't forget, in the commercial world, a little bit about faith, a high yield means a more secondary property than, yes. a, than a lower yield. And so we've got this window of opportunity where a lot of uh, vendors are coming up to refinance. They're finding that perhaps um, you know, there's a lot of sectors now that are really struggling, like secondary offices and retail. So they may be finding they can't get the rents or the tenants they could have done previously. They're coming up to refinance. Debt is very expens expensive. And so as a result, kind of there's much more motivation. And as, well, as we all know, that's what governs the pricing of, yeah. of assets. So motivation, uh, the fact the market, like the tag, uh, market tag of prices has gone up as well. Um, and also, you know, I think that in terms of in terms of the Labour government, I you know, I think we're all probably bracing ourselves for what yes. they're going to do to Resi, but it's just not a it's just not a vote winner with commercial. Mm. There's no reason for them to you know, commercial is actually quite um, got a lot of legislation. It's quite regulated. Yeah. There's no real election or kind of public. Um, 
newspaper, you know, newspaper headline type reason for Labour government to uh, do anything to commercial, mm. basically because it's not emotional, it's no. just business. It's far more affected by the economy though, isn't it? It is. You know, so when yeah. the economy is doing really well, you know, and booming, then obviously commercial does very well because business is expanding, exactly. they want more premises, but when times are tough, they're kind of contracting a little bit and they maybe don't need offices. And I think there's there's been this big move from people working in office going back home, and that's because of COVID. So that's changed the landscape a lot, hasn't it? It has, yeah. So you've got, what's what's really important to know about commercial at the moment is that you cannot generalise about it because yeah. there's growth sectors, there's sectors that are really struggling. Yeah. Um, obviously, the real opportunities are in those sectors that are struggling because you can take, for example, a secondary office where a lease has expired, a landlord really has no hope of letting it to a tenant again. And you can look at it and say, okay, well, I can either do this a conversion to another commercial use, I can convert yeah. it to residential, or I can just split it up into smaller units where it's more marketable. I can yes. get higher rents, I can get better leases. And so once you know some of those tricks of the trade, suddenly this kind of this this stock that maybe isn't like flavor of the month anymore suddenly can be repurposed and yeah. actually can increase in value. I think that's a really important point for everyone to get because if someone's got a contract, a long lease that's coming to the end, and they're just thinking, I need to find a similar tenant. But if that tenant doesn't really exist anymore, they're going to struggle. But so what we're doing, you're repurposing. Because if you just took that on and wanted to do the same thing, you'd have the same problem. Absolutely. So it's all about applying a little bit of knowledge and how can you use different. So uh, we were talking uh, before the, we started recording about Dan. So Dan Hill, a good friend of both of ours. Uh, Dan was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And um, he has his big commercial building, Manco House, that he bought. And I know he was thinking about turning into a flat. And you advised him, no, don't do that. <laughs> Turn it into smaller units, which he did. And he pretty much doubled the value of that asset um, just by renting it out in smaller units and filling the building up. And you know, it would be very, we, we're not doing much work to it. It's literally splitting it to, to add that much value to a residential, you'd have to do a massive refurb. But that's the point, if you're using a bit of knowledge and a bit of expertise, you can actually add massive value without spending a lot of money sometimes. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. and um, and he bought really well as well. See, that is, you know, in 30 yes. years of property, that is absolutely the number one tip. Yeah. And then, yeah, kind of just get it fully let. And, you know, all valuers are looking at and banks are looking at is the risk. Yeah. You know, if, if, the, if there's multiple streams of income coming in, just like as investors, yes. um, and they can see that their risk is covered, then they're going to value at a higher value because, you know, the risk is lower. Yeah. And, you know, I have many clients that come to me and they, um, they, they bought a property, they want to convert to residential. And the very first thing I say to them is, right, let's look at the commercial base case. Yeah. And um, I've had quite a few clients now where we've gone through the numbers together. And actually, they've realized that over five years, they'll get better returns by just leaving it as commercial, doing a lease renewal rather than doing an expensive conversion. And the conversion is always there to do. Yeah. It's just it's not... You don't need to do it's it. It's nice to have away. that as a backup plan. Absolutely, isn't it? yeah. Because yeah. yeah. at some point, that probably will be turned into conversion, uh, yeah. commercial, uh, residential, sorry. And, um, and obviously, the Labour government are very keen to build all these hundreds of thousands of homes every year, or rather, stimulate us as developers to build those properties. So um, hopefully that's going to always be around as, a, as an exit, which is good. Yeah, I think it will be. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't introduce an element of affordable housing into permission sure development. Yes. But I think it will be. And the beauty of, I mean, whenever myself or any of my clients buy a commercial property, the very first thing I say is, right, let's look at the multiple exits. Because yeah. it's all about that. It's kind of, yeah, okay, so there's a commercial base case. Can you put other commercial uses in? Can you split it up? Can you do a conversion later, mixed use, whatever it might be? Let's make sure we've got at least four or five exits so that we kind of bulletproof on it. Yeah, and you made a really good point about um, one of the most important tips is buy well. And I think that goes back to what I talk about in Property Magic, and obviously we do a mastermind, it's all about finding that motivated seller. Yeah. That seller who's got a problem, they're tired, they don't want to manage it anymore, they just want to get rid of the problem, we can step in and, and what's a lead weight around their neck, we can take that lead weight, use it in a different way and suddenly turn it into gold. Yeah, and, and really the top two ways, well there's the top three ways at the moment of buying commercial really. Number one is auctions. Yep. Obviously, motivated vendors, they want to just get rid, of, get rid of their property, you know, get a decent price. 
Um, I think probably still a little bit little aggressive in auctions at the moment, probably mm. for commercial, but I think they'll, they'll come down a bit. Number two is direct-to-vendor. Obviously, we find those motivated vendors through direct-to-vendor, yes. and especially you can target that by sector and location. Yep. And then third is something that I think a lot of residential investors don't know about, which is that probably somewhere between 60 and 70% of commercial deals are done off-market yeah. through agents. So to build great relationships with commercial agents, to... Um, to get those off-market deals, because a lot of um, vendors don't want the market to know maybe they're advertising at a below market value. Yeah. Um, if you're a cash buyer and you can move quickly, you can get some great deals at the moment. Yeah, and one of the ways you can fund commercial property is through using pensions. And so uh, one of the things we teach our clients, if you have a business, it's probably really good to get a SaaS pension. You can pull other pensions together and you can use those to buy and control commercial property as well, can't you? Absolutely. It's a real beauty of commercial that you can hold um, a commercial property in a SaaS and you, know, you can get income through the SaaS. It's obviously tax free as well, which, yeah. is, which is great. There's some little tricks and tips for that. So for example, there's this massive advantage with commercial property, which capital allowances. Yes. And obviously you can't claim those within a SAS, so yeah. you can buy outside your SAS, claim the capital allowances, and then put it into your SAS. So yes, different ways definitely. of structuring And that. also when you buy commercial, it's less stamp duty than residential as well, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah, so there are lots yeah. of benefits to commercial property. You do need to know what you're doing. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, Susie, you're going to be one of the guests on our next coming up virtual property exhibition. Uh, so we're going to put a link below the video in the show notes uh, to come and register for that. And also I think you're doing some online training, some live online training all about how people can start get to get going in commercial property. So we'll put a link to that training in the show notes as well. And if you had one final piece of advice, uh, maybe not just about commercial, but if, if people want to be really successful investors, what would that piece of advice be? I think um, start with the end in mind. So work out where you want to get to um, and, you know, why, why you want to get there, you yeah. know, and make, try not to make that too arbitrary because I think it can be. And then, um, and then basically work back from that. And I think that applies to all investing. Um, I see so many people that um, I, I just, just start wrong. And mm -hmm. so, so to start right. And, you know, for example, if you're leaving a job, to get that cash flow covered first yeah. and you know find deals that, that can generate high cash flow to begin with before you kind of go up the levels and maybe um, try and create equity or you know do development deals or whatever um, and you know that that's where commercial is great because you can actually get regular cash flow as you say pay quarterly in advance from good tenants on property that you know increases in value because it's let and so there's, there's you know, lots of benefits of doing that. Yeah, fantastic advice. Susie, thank you so much for coming sharing. And it's so great to see how much you've developed on your property journey. And so thanks for spending the time with us today. I'm sure you've inspired many people. So guys, make sure you click on the links in the description uh, to come and check out the virtual property exhibition and also Susie's online training as well. And until next time, I'd like to encourage you to invest with knowledge, invest with skill. Now, if you're watching the YouTube video, please do come and like the video. Put a comment below. If you have any questions, maybe we'll give Susie access to that so you can come and answer any questions you have. Um, and also make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to make sure whenever we bring out a new video, you're one of the first people to be notified. So as ever, enjoy the next video. Invest with knowledge, invest with skill.